Hello and welcome to my first and hopefully not my last video on the flat earth theory. I finally did it. Uh, there's been an incredible uptick in debate on the topic between so-called flat earthers and so-called ball earthers. While I was leaving a comment about a particular map someone had found, I thought it might be a great opportunity to share some helpful information. This information will be helpful to flat earthers, but will also be appreciated by ball earthers. So I expect only to be thought of as a peacemaker for my efforts. And I expect some respect, at least, for my experience in this specific area, seeing that I'm both a sailor and a pilot with countless voyages at sea and hours in flight. Uh, those of you who know me know of my many adventures and know that I've got some mean navigation skills. But enough about me. Uh, let's start right in and start learning some cool stuff. This is a good refresher for me as well. And I guarantee that if you've recently been involved in debate or discussion on the flat earth topic from either side or the middle, uh, you'll find this information fascinating. We'll start with this map. This is about the most basic useful example of a particular type of map. This type of map is called an azimuthal equidistant map. Now there are versions of this map that look quite different and many variations because it's one of the map styles that can be more useful by changing its topography depending upon your location and intended use. One thing they will all have in common though is they will all be generally circular in shape. However, I have noticed a few people out there citing the map as being a flat earth map, which I think is incorrect. At least if we consider that they're implying the map maker or cartographer intended to depict a truly flat earth in this way. In reality, and from examples across many centuries now, this map style has been created by ball earthers looking mainly to depict a ball earth with a single flat circle. So I think the most logical and honest way to understand what the map is or what it's depicting begins with imagining a ball earth. Even better, we can look directly down on a common globe of the Earth. Now imagine that the two hemispheres, north and south, or top and bottom, are split in two. Starting with the northern hemisphere, imagine pushing down on the semicircular dome shape until it becomes flat. What results would be pretty close to what we see here. However, objects closer to the center of the circle circle will have compressed slightly while objects closer to the edge will have expanded slightly. Now imagine the bottom half that we can't see becoming extremely flexible, almost elastic. In a sense we need to take we need to turn it inside out from the very center of the south pole. But as we do we'll need to stretch it wide enough to become visible around the existing portion and we'll need to flatten the whole thing as well. With the top half of the globe compressed flat without widening that circle, and the bottom half pulled up and around from the center to merge with the top half, we've created an azimuthal equidistant map. Before we get into how this type of map is, is commonly used today, let's look at a few historical examples. Going as far back in time as I could for the earliest example that was at least somewhat common and well known, I found this map from 1320. It was made by Pietro Vesconte. I would need to look closer and do some research to know how accurate it really is. This relates to how the map is often drawn dependent upon the maker's location. But to my eye, it looks like a damn good map. I mean, it's hard to imagine it was created without the aid of technology unavailable at the time. Uh, if not that, then spiritual guidance or extrasensory perception or something might have been involved. Next, here's an example from 1350 by Renolf Higden from his Polychromicon. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that this thing is completely whacked out. Uh, if you're someone who thinks the Earth is much younger than claimed, that it's expanding over time, or that the land masses have morphed to an extreme degree in the past millennia, then this map may be for you. I believe some of that, by the way. Uh, skipping along exactly 100 years to 1450, because the last one was from 1350, we have a map by Frey Maro, uh, a Venetian, I believe. It's quite detailed, but I can't say how accurate it might be. 
The most recent map of this type I'm going to show you is this one, from 1890 actually, the Gleason's New Standard Map. At this point, the accuracy has improved to the degree that risk analysis for global shipping didn't consider it an unacceptable legal liability uh, to have people navigating by this map um, or something very close to it. Notice that it reads Longitude and Time Calculator. This is a good clue to its modern day use. It's also a clue to the shortcomings of an azimuthal equidistant map. And here's why. If you recall what it took to contort that globe of Earth um, into the flat and circular disk that we see with this map, there was massive distortion occurring, obviously. It's like pyarding or filleting a ball, which will produce strips all around, but laid flat, those strips will have large triangular gaps between them. So what this map does is, so, is to stretch the area latitudinally to bridge those gaps. More importantly though, the lines of longitude are kept perfectly straight in the process. Hence the term longitude calculator shown here. As the Earth is divided into what are called meridians, it requires division by some marker, which are the lines of longitude. But this does create a problem for anyone hoping to use a map of this type for navigation purposes. Navigation involves directionality and distance. This kind of map is pretty much horrible for use at either. But it's perfectly accurate for navigation purposes if your point of departure and destination are both located along one of those lines of longitude, which is not very likely. Just as unlikely though, uh, but not totally unreal real unrealistic, is that both points will fall on two adjacent lines. This map is designed for plotting in straight lines, but to attempt to correctly plot a course that could be navigated between two adjacent lines of longitude will send you off course. The true distance will also the true distance will also be anywhere up to anywhere up to 100% off depending upon how uh, how far away your points are from that map's center. Now, I mentioned how this variety of map is often tailored to suit. Uh, you can see why this might be helpful or necessary from what we've learned about its limitations. Basically, you'll find examples of this map that disregard the poles and center the map on a point of interest or where someone is located. For example, here's one that's centered on Cairo, Egypt. Here's a version centered on New York. You'll find other examples usually centered on ports of call, uh, but you can see how understanding more about how this map is designed and how it differs from other maps could curb some of your enthusiasm about the concept of an arctic wall surrounding a flat earth disk. That's not to say it's an impossibility, but if, we're to, uh, if we were to shift the area of the earth just right, centering it on, on the spot exactly opposite um, North Africa, for example, we could create a fully functional and entirely authentic version of the map with a great wall of North Africa surrounding it. But if we continue shifting things, theoretically, we could create a version where any place became at least a thin wall around it, like, let's say, oh, Bakersfield, <laughs> the Great Wall of Bakersfield, or Compton, <laughs> for instance, any place. I have two maps to show you before I conclude. The first is this one, which I thought was relevant because some maps like this will employ the same technique as an azimuthal equidistant map, but they do it without, without joining the two halves. The result is actually less distorted, but lacks the ability to plot both distance and direction with a straight line in one line along the longitudinal lines it's interesting nonetheless. And finally, this map. You may have seen people pointing to this logo, which is the United Nations official symbol, as some degree of evidence that the Earth is flat. It's true that there are 33 quadrants, or hextants, or whatever, counting the middle circle. And I'm not going to argue this choice of map isn't significant. It might be but from what we've seen and considering how common the azimuthal maps are, it seems less clear. 
Some may argue that the map shown here is largely accurate, but lacks one crucial element, the southern Arctic wall that should be surrounding it. As someone with a fair amount of design experience, I think I can understand why that might have been left out. For If, for instance, I was designing the symbol myself and did include the outer land mass um, or that Arctic area, Arctic wall area, I can imagine I might have thought it looked too much like one of the concentric circular lines um, or that it conflicted with the outermost line. And considering the thickness of those lines, the outermost line may actually look very much like this southern Arctic wall. So omitting it would have been maybe one option and it made it look cleaner, for example. And I would have considered that. Plus, other maps aren't necessarily or aren't usually circular. And this circle shape is very easy to work with in a logo type, just for example. That concludes my presentation, which I hope was interesting and informative. Uh, this was a big detour from my usual fare. Mainly, I hope it's helpful to all the flat earthers out there whose courage and creativity I do admire. Thank you.